So let me thank the organizers for inviting me here and also enjoying very much to be part of this program. Uh, I speak today about work that we are doing together with my experimental friends in, in Innsbruck about, you know, that has to do with learning entanglement in quantum simulation and they're sort of making steady progress as we meet each other at these conferences and I would like to report here uh, today about that. So I guess that all of us know that uh, quantum antibody sort of wave function entanglement, this is uh, underlying uh, the hard core of what we uh, care about when you do quantum computing and also quantum simulation. So learning about it, I think, is uh, very important. And you want to uh, actually learn about these things in the limit. But the number of particles is very large. Um, of course, we as theorists you know, have thought about different protocols, how to learn, and what we actually would like to learn in this whole context. But uh, we are in a very special situation in Spook because uh, to the extent that you're good friends with your experimental colleagues, we can convince them to do experiments, not only, I mean, after us writing a theory paper, but, I mean, just uh, basically you have some ideas and you go right away to the experiment and you try some of these things out. And this is sort of ongoing work uh, along these lines, uh, which I would like to uh, actually talk about here. Uh, the experimental device is a 51 uh, qubit programmable trapped ion quantum simulator. And uh, the people that are involved in this context on the theory side, uh, Christian Kockel is here. Uh, Andreas Elm is here, was sort of involved in many of these previous work behind that. And uh, this is the experimental team uh, over here where Christian Ross and also Heiner Blatt are, are the leaders of the, of the experimental lab. So let me at the beginning sort of point out that this conference here, you know, talks about many platforms, different quantum devices and so on. And I've just picked out a few of these examples that are also represented here. We have here Rydberg atoms, uh, Hubbard models, uh, superconducting qubits, uh, trapped ions, and as I said now earlier, I'll mainly talk about the trapped ions over here because this is experiment that we have actually access to. Um, let me also point out that there's been quite some progress in Innsbruck, not at the point of fitting a quantum simulator where one can do, for example, 90 ions. Uh, uh, actually, Christian Ross is doing these experiments where one can do 90 ions in something that's a kind of a 2D type configuration. So it will be very interesting to see quantum simulation with trapped ions being developed uh, along uh, these kind of 2D structures that we have here. So uh, learning about entanglement uh, here, uh, essentially what I will talk about in the following is to do how to do entanglement Hamiltonian tomography in the real experimental setting, also a little bit from the point of view of quantum technology. And it'd be sort of more precise, I always like to show this photo that uh, Rainer Blatt gave me at one point, which is here the 51 uh, trapped ion string that they have. Uh, this is uh, the trapped ions in here. Uh, this is just the experimental lab that they have with uh, uh, all of the, you know, lasers, whatever that exists. And uh, of course, from our point of view, what's being done is that this system realizes Hamiltonian, uh, which is a transverse Isaac model here. Uh, you can see that there's actually long range interaction. Alpha typically is about 1.2, this order of magnitude, uh, with a transverse field usually operated in the limit where B is much larger than this cup XJ that we have here. Uh, and uh, this Hamiltonian is realized in a very faithful way. But uh, we have also, in addition, single side addressing here from laser beams doing essentially single qubit rotations, uh, but also then the corresponding readout. So, this is a prototypical example of what has been called now for a few years, programmable quantum simulator, which is scalable to a relatively large particle number. I mean, we are in 1D, of course, over here. But all of the story that I will tell in the following will also apply to 2D setups like we have with Rydbergs. Uh, it is restricted, as it is written over here, to a certain class of Hamiltonians. However, these are realized with very, by, with very high fidelity. And uh, when we do quench dynamics with these uh, Hamiltonians, they really correspond to the Hamiltonians that we write down. Um, I want to emphasize that in the following, we will also do variational uh, quantum eye solver, where sometimes it turns out that the experiments reveal that the Hamiltonians that the experimentalists thought that they had, you know, are not entirely true, but we sort of learn all of these things on the fly in a particular variational quantum eye solver and so on. will be very robust regarding some of these errors that we have. So here's the story that I want to talk about. Um, you know, we start out sort of, you know, with some questions that I really care about, which is basic quantum antibody physics, where we talk about entanglement, like you prepare a certain state, you make quench dynamics, and you ask yourself, I mean, uh, how many characterize entanglement, like a bipart entanglement that we're writing down over here. But in order to do that, we have to develop, again, on the theory side, but then also at the end, bring to the experiment, 
um, uh, enabling protocols that we call them, you know, where we prepare and measure quantum states. Uh, you know, the variational quantum eigensolver will one of these things showing up, randomized measurements. So John Preskill talked about these things earlier. And uh, then at the end, you want to run these things on the, on the real machine. And then, yeah, hopefully learning something about the entanglement over here. So let me start out in my talk here by sort of a, on, a, on a very technical side, which is uh, I want to show you how on these machines down here, uh, something like uh, variational quantum eigensolver works with 51 particles, what we can achieve and what we cannot achieve in uh, this context over here. So the prototypical setup that we always have is this, you know, if you have a, a quantum simulator, you might do some quench dynamics. There have been a very large number of experiments along these lines. You can do your measurement uh, actually in, in, uh, in any basis that you want over here. Uh, and you would repeat the experiment, you know, building up certain probabilities for these bit strings that we have here. Uh, but then it's quite obvious that this then also provides a toolbox to do variational quantum simulation uh, in the sense that we can, uh, uh, for example, uh, entangling, apply the entangling Hamiltonian, like the icing model we talked about, having single qubit rotations over here entangled and build up certain circuits, producing then a certain wave function. And then the usual kind of story will start uh, that we know so well from these variational classical algorithms that we have a certain target Hamiltonian that we write down on a piece of paper. And of course, uh, we can always write the expectation value, which is the energy whose minimum we would like to find at the end, though as the expectation value in terms of these variational states. And you can see that uh, what this uh, feedback loop over here does is that it's meshing all of these correlation functions like expectation value of the first one. Uh, this would be a two particle correlate and so on. And you want to add it up and then minimize. And um, well, there's been many reviews and also people here in the audience, of course, I know have been main contributors to all of that. I don't have to say much more about it. Uh, let's sort of see you know, uh, how this works in practice and what we can do, because as I said, that's kind of the starting point uh, for the things that we want to do then afterwards. Uh, in the context of the trapped ions, you know, we have here a certain target Hamiltonian, for example, that we are writing down. Uh, and the resources that we have available in the lab in order to build up the circuits are written here. This could be, for example, entangling XY model gates over here, then the single qubit rotations. What I really want to emphasize is the fact that uh, even though an experimentalist might not know these Hamiltonians in all detail, to the extent that the errors are actually static, um, you know, building up a circle like this is something that can be repeated many times and they sort of repeat also the corresponding errors. But uh, when you do the variational quantum eigensolver as one of the examples, you know, uh, then you will find that the results, you know, because you're optimizing for a relevant cost function like the energy or some amount of function that you might be interested in, I know uh, this sort of you know, uh, compensates for these errors that you have. So you don't have to calibrate your machine, which in the context of 51 particles is actually uh, relatively hard. Uh, sort of going back in time a few years ago, you know, we were at the point where we took models like the Schwinger model. It's not important over here. Uh, what's important is that uh, uh, actually Rick van Beinen and also Christian developed uh, a certain algorithms that really run on the quantum machine that do global optimization in the noisy landscape. Uh, at that point, it was 15 parameters, circuit depths of about six, and uh, built into the whole program was that you can do actually 10 to the five calls to the simulators and then run feedback loop and then get the best results, you know, uh, within a certain amount of time, which is maybe typically one afternoon in, in the lab. And we were producing plots like, you know, the energy sort of going down here. And um, I think what was accepted at that point was also this kind of self-verification that we were uh, actually, John mentioned this in his talk on, on Monday morning. Uh, we were able to measure, for example, variances over here. What we did at that point is just naively write down all of the corresponding correlation functions and measure them. Uh, but the great thing was you could see that, you know, how when you proceed down here with the energy, that really at the end, the error bar was smaller than the first excited state, which was, of course, a finite size effect in the particular case over here. So all of these toolbox were developed. And you might ask, uh, does it also work for the 51 ions? And uh, let me just give you one example that will be important afterwards. Suppose that you decide, you know, that uh, you want to do variation quantum eigensolver for, for a target model, uh, let's say an uh, XXC Heisenberg model, like I'm writing down over here. And uh, if delta is equal to one, it might be at one of these critical points here. It's a gap phase. This is a critical phase over here. And then um, simply write down the circuit, you know, uh, a circuit where you hope that it might lead you close to the ground state. There's a certain art of writing these things down. Uh, Christian Kockel has some experience very often these things work like that, that he tries it out numerically on small scale theoretical uh, calculations and then simply 
goes to the experiment or maybe at the end and also some large DMRG calculations to see uh, to what extent these uh, circuits really scale. Let me just show you an, uh, a result because the technical details here are not very important. Now, when you have these energies, you can see how it's a function of this iteration of this uh, VQE uh, protocol, you go down and down. Obviously, for these 51 ions, we don't reach the ground states. And to sort of give you a feeling where we are, you know, uh, let me simply call it low temperature. Low temperature is actually wrong because we got the coherent superposition of all of these lowest states that I have here. But typically in these experiments, you might reach that out of 10 to the 14 states, you know, 2 to the 51, uh, about 300 of these lowest lying states will be occupied. So the kind of physics is not that we can say we are going to study features of ground states, but we are going to study features of uh, a very narrow band of energies, you know, close to the ground states. And in terms of energies, I mean, this is a few percent uh, above the ground state relative to the overall scale of the Hamiltonian, uh, which we are writing down over here. So this is not perfect life, but, you know, given the short purpose, uh, a, a short circuit like this thing here, with five layers and uh, 10 parameters, uh, this is something that works extremely well. Uh, but that's not really the main goal of our exercise here. Uh, what we really want to do is we want to learn about, you know, quantum many body physics. And let me tell you now the story that we are interested in from the physics point of view and uh, what we are actually aiming for. Um, well, just to fix some notation, the obvious, you know, suppose that we prepare a ground state in the following or something which is an approximate ground state. Uh, we'll talk about the reduced density matrix and there will be bipartite entanglement if you write down, for example, von Neumann entropy. In the past, we always, uh, you know, uh, measured Rainy entropies, maybe second order Rainy entropy. We'll see in the following now really von Neumann entropies coming up. And uh, what's relevant in our case will be the entanglement Hamiltonian. So we would like to do at the end then a tomography, hopefully an efficient tomography by learning the entanglement Hamiltonian. And you can see by writing it in this particular form, this will be a mixed state. So it's a Gibbs ensemble with sort of the Hamiltonian being the entanglement Hamiltonian over here. You can always define that. Uh, at the end for us, it will be very important that we can argue that this entanglement Hamiltonian has actually a quasi-local structure. So the question now to be asked is this, uh, can we learn the operator structure of the entanglement Hamiltonian? And for this to be true, of course, uh, this, uh, this structure has to be relatively simple. And you can see right away that uh, if you got this bipartite entanglement over here, so that this entanglement entropy for Neumann is just the expectation value, obviously, for this uh, Hamiltonian that we uh, want to measure now in the following. So knowing the Hamiltonian, and we found that, we immediately get then the von Neumann entropy kind of for free. So to set the stage for the discussion, okay, let's think about a many-body problem. We want this to be a local Hamiltonian. And of course, uh, typically, you uh, know, local Hamiltonian means that the number of terms that you have over here will actually scale polynomially with the system size. And here is drawn a uh, corresponding energy spectrum. Actually, this is the first uh, 100 states from the Heisenberg model over here. So it goes uh, much, much higher up. What I see in the following is not, should not be related to the particular scale here. Just take this as a bunch of energy levels that we have here. Uh, and uh, we then take a model and I said, well, why not take the Heisenberg model that I talked about earlier, where I just showed you that we can prepare, maybe not a ground state, but something that's, you know, energy-wise, not too far away from the ground state. And then we can start to ask questions like, suppose that you are able to prepare the ground state and you're able to prepare uh, an excited state. In the experiment, you're never able to do that, but for the discussion at the moment, let's sort of assume that this is what you have. And then all of you know that uh, a ground state, uh, you know, typically has, for example, uh, area law. Um, you know, this is going away from the critical point here. If you're at the critical point, there will be, you know, uh, there will be a logarithmic term, you know, with a C out in front, which will be the central charge uh, in, uh, in one dimension. Uh, and uh, if you go to the excited state, you know, a typical excited state would have uh, a volume law entanglement. You know, it goes, goes like volume, and uh, this would be like a thermal entropy. Uh, and, uh, of course, this volume law and uh, area law states would sort of live in different parts of the Hilbert space. And what we normally argue when we talk about, for example, classical simulation with a tensor network is that we exploit the fact that these states down here are relatively weakly entangled in 1D. This gives them, of course, right to the MPS, DMRG, and all of these things. I want to emphasize that if you have a quantum simulator, then a quantum simulator is able to, you know, represent uh, volume law entanglement. Um, and uh, we will afterwards would like to see the transition between these two uh, in corresponding experiments. 
Um, so let me sort of argue now as following. Let's take, for example, that we have uh, prepared, you're not able to do that experimentally, but for the sake of the argument here, uh, one of the excited states. If I take the trace of the rest of the system that, I mean, ETH, if you believe it, and let's assume that this is true now, uh, means that we got an, uh, that we got a thermal Gibbs state over here where HA is roughly the Hamiltonian, you know, modular some boundary effects, uh, which lives in the particular subsystem uh, that we have here. So given the Hamiltonian I wrote earlier, this is just the Hamiltonian, you know, for the subsystem uh, living in this uh, uh, subsystem A, like I'm indicating down here, and also for the ion string that we have here. And um, if I would ask you, you know, uh, maybe you should now make plots, you know, of this state over here. And I insisting to do it in the form, I'm simply saying, well, we got a certain subsystem over here. Let me plot this local temperature, which trivially, if I got a Gibbs state, would be constant. So a state like this, the reduced density matrix, would be represented by something that's basically a flat line over the region of interest that we have over here. And A bar or B is sort of the, the remaining part of your, of your um, um, a spin chain. And if you do that for larger and larger system sizes, you know, we have flat local temperature, but we will also see that right away, this is simply thermal entropy, you know, you will get in 1D volume law entanglement, which is linear, that's what we expect. And at that point, you might ask, you know, what will happen if you actually cool now here, um, close to the ground state, or even then at the end to the ground state, uh, what do we know about the corresponding reduced density matrix? And it turns out that this reduced density matrix, and this is um, still fascinated by that, also has the form of a Gibbs ensemble with the local temperature, but it will be the sort of, you know, uh, unusual dependence of the inverse local temperature that will be the feature. And uh, uh, while up here we have sort of this volume law entanglement, you know, if you go to the ground state, I want to argue now, and this is what we want to see at the end in the experiment, that uh, the ground state reduced density matrix, and that's also true for the first few excited states, as we will see at the end. Then in the case um, of the, uh, in the case of a CFT, uh, conformal field theory has a parabolic dependence. So this is the signature that we will be after afterwards, and we would like to see this transition from volume law to every long dependence, and then maybe also see corresponding dependency in terms of the von Neumann entropy, where we can look at different system sizes. We can see in order to even start to ask questions of this type, you have to be able at the end to do an entanglement Hamiltonian tomography for relatively large system sizes. I will show you afterwards up to 18, something like that, but Christian tells me that he can now do up to about even 22, so uh, which I think is actually quite amazing, and uh, we want to look at the scaling then with the system size as one of the features. So in this sense, this uh, parameterization that I'm writing down over here with a local inverse temperature is something that uh, we are going to argue now why this should sort of happen and why this is the feature that we want. And this leads me to something that I'm still, you know, amazed that it exists, which is this uh, entanglement Hamiltonian in relativistic quantum field theories, you know, uh, known originally as the Pisoniana Wichmann theorem, but then there's also corresponding versions that are, you know, for conformal field theory. So when you take a relativistic quantum field theory with a local Hamiltonian, and of course, uh, built in, you have Lorentz invariance, um, and uh, you look at the vacuum state, which is the ground state of your quantum field theory. Uh, of course, I emphasize that this is then automatically uh, in the continuum. Uh, then the entanglement Hamiltonian would correspond, supposed to a pi partition of this space into uh, half A and the other half B. And we assume, according to Pisson and Wichmann, that this is infinite. Uh, then if you take a trace of a part of the system over here, uh, like trace of a B of the vacuum, then it is a mathematical theorem of these axiomatic field theories uh, that uh, it is the form of a, of a Gibbs state with a local temperature. And this local temperature is proportional to X. So this means that if you want to plot this temperature, it has the form of a, of a ramp. You know, here the temperature is very, very high uh, because it is very mixed, it is very entangled. And if you move it into the bulk, then it cools down. And this is an exact statement in the particular context that we have uh, over here as a relativistic quantum field theory, known as the Pisciniana Wichmann theorem. I want to uh, point out that there's a very nice review by Marcello Dalmonte and, and friends here uh, that uh, you know, gives a full account of all of these things and the application of these ideas at the end to condensed metaphysics. And uh, we wrote papers initially with Marcello and uh, also um, with, uh, with Benoit uh, about some of these things, how to measure that and how to realize uh, a few years ago. If you add more symmetry, like scale invariance as a conformal field theory, 
then the statement is simply that this inverse temperature has now the form of a parabola. And all of these statements are valid not only in one dimension, but also higher dimension. But there's, of course, a uh, very large body of uh, work, you know, with one plus one dimensional conformal field theories where one is able to write down or sort of work out even for finite strips and uh, finite temperature in quench dynamics, not only for ground state, these corresponding entanglement Hamiltonian. And this provides kind of a setting that we come in and say, you know, first of all, let's translate these ideas now into condensed matter context. But also then can we see these things as ground states of many body physics in an experiment. So uh, if you adapt these ideas, and I say adapt really means that it's no longer theory right now to, to let these uh, ideas, uh, and you want to look at now at the ground state of the many body model and no longer your vacuum, uh, you would have here the Gibbs state, and you know, as I said before, and this is now indicative of a lattice that we have over here. The sort of you know, substitution rule that uh, we have now in mind is this, that we can get the entanglement Hamiltonian simply by writing down the system Hamiltonian and deforming it. And the predictions are that, for example, in the case of, a C of, uh, of the CFT, this would be in the form of a parabola that we have over here. You can talk a lot about validity over here. I know uh, this is uh, discussed in some of these reviews here because this is uh, an approximate thing that we are doing. There's a lot of analytical results and models that show these uh, things come out from analytical simple cases that we can study and a lot of numerical evidence. But I also want to emphasize that these ideas here suggest that if you want to make an ansatz for an efficient process of, for an efficient entanglement Hamiltonian tomography, then it simply says that, you know, it is a deformation of the system Hamiltonian and you might find then what these parameters are, but also test maybe for additional terms over here with your quantum protocol that you have to design in this context. So if I go back now to the slide that we had before, I mean, uh, this is the, you know, thing that you want to see. I just talked about in the case of, uh, of a CFD. Um, and this is what you would get in theory if you take the Heisenberg model. You can see that Here's the thermal distribution, it's pretty flat. You know, it's not completely flat, but it's pretty flat. And this is, you know, this is up to 10 system size, very nice volume law entanglement. And if you go to the ground state, it shows the expected parabola and so on. And uh, this would be a corresponding simulation, you know, of how would we actually measure this thing. This is the logarithmic dependence over here. Can we see that in the experiment? I want to show you the result of the experiment right away, at least as we have it at the moment. And uh, I think it comes out very beautiful if you go to the ground state. You can see now here system sizes up to 17, you know, uh, this very nice parabola. Let me point out that up to about, I think, 9 or 10 here. This was really fitting the uh, as, uh, individual parameters, these inverse, uh, the inverse temperatures, as you can see over here. And uh, for the larger ones, you made a simpler uh, parameterization by having an offset of a parabola, allowing some flexibility, but because then the number of parameters, if you really want to fit everything, would become too large. But you can, at the end, and also this is part of protocols, work out certain fidelities that you have in the context here and uh, measure fidelities in the experiments. We don't have results or plots for these things right now, but part of these things have been calculated where you verify that the uh, reproduction of your reduced density operator sort of, you know, has a certain fidelity like 99% fitting the experimental data and then another set of experimental data. I'll talk about this later. For the thermal case, you can see that there's an offset and then it's kind of flat exactly, um, you know, what you would expect uh, up to the system size. And at the moment uh, on the computer at home, these things are running for larger system sizes. And here's the corresponding results. At that point, you might wonder, you know, in the experiment, we had a VQE ground state. That's an approximate ground state. You might actually be puzzled why these things uh, sort of work so well. Um, but you can see that out here, there are some deviations where one might argue, you know, that these are sort of errors that come from the fact that we do not have the real ground state. And there's some memory of this uh, variational quantum eigensolver still built into the whole model over here. Uh, here's sort of a summary of this, you know, theory, ground state. Uh, if you do uh, the corresponding VQE circuit, theoretically, you can see that this thing is a little bit flatter because it's hotter under, under quotes, you know. And then we have here the experiment, which is the VQE circuit, you know, here still for a relatively small system. This was the attempt to uh, extract the central charge, but it has finite temperature and it is finite widths and so on. So um, it's at the moment still 1.1 uh, 1 or 1.2 or whatever. Uh, this is something to be improved, yeah. I always like to show this thing sort of at the at the end of this part of my talk over here because it um, shows a little bit where we would like to go in the future. Uh, I had some you know um, email exchanges uh, with with Gifre Vidal, 
to what extent, you know, these um, ideas of Pisciniano Wichmann uh, and the CFT predictions, you know, would come out in a, in a MERA network, you know, because we can do MERA tomography, we can look at all of these things like the renormalization flow uh, in these setups over here. And this is, of course, also something which is very reminiscent of these discussions that in particular in the AMO context, uh, Monica Schleier-Smith started some, some time ago. Maybe talk about uh, ADS CFT correspondence, uh, where our quantum simulator sort of uh, lives out here at the, at the edge and uh, uh, sort of, you know, the coordinate that goes in here. And I'm citing papers here from Swingle and, and all of these famous people down here and the connection between entanglement and, and, uh, and geometry, you know, that we might be able to discover over here. Uh, we have sort of, you know, all of the tools to study our G flow. We have all of these tools to study you know, some of these entanglement proper properties over here uh, in these systems because we have the tools available both to produce in an approximate sense, of course, uh, ground state of these systems here, and also the tools to measure corresponding entanglement simulators. And just to show you that's a little bit uh, crazy at the moment, there's all of these papers out there on uh, this, it's called the entropic forces. They take certain subregions over here, you know, we can take subregions here, here, then a certain distance between them, we can then plot the corresponding inverse temperatures. We can do the Hamiltonian tomography. We see cross terms, and at the end, these things have, need to be interpreted. Uh, this is simply saying that um, I sort of see that this is a very interesting direction to, to go to. But personally, I still have to learn a lot about this, uh, the deeper meaning of some of these, you know, uh, statements behind entropic forces and so on. Uh, let me now sort of move over and to close this whole story uh, by saying a few words about how we measure all of that. And um, I would like to compliment what, what actually John said on Monday morning. And I know that also um, Andreas Elm has been giving a talk here at, at the program. Um, uh, know what the tools are that allow us to actually measure these kind of things. And I will be very short uh, on this part over here because this is maybe more technicality at this point, uh, sort of enabling the physics. But nonetheless, I, I want to mention briefly. So. Uh, we wrote some papers some time ago, and it's really Andreas Elm and, uh, and also Benoit who were uh, in our group behind that. Um, and uh, there's, of course, uh, classical shadows. Uh, classical shadows, I mean, what uh, John and collaborator achieved was really to show all of the relevant mathematical proofs. I guess we were sort of coming uh, from different sides over here, but there's a very nice review that should come out very soon now. You know, it is under this motto, measure first, ask questions later that uh, had to do with the fact that many of these data that were taken originally in some of these experiments could be recycled later in the spirit of this statement here in order to see interesting stuff. Um, what we do right now is really that we're asking new questions. So these old data are no longer sufficient uh, to do all of that. But uh, very briefly, let me just tell you uh, what is being done there because it sort of hints how we do this kind of an uh, efficient, and I quote, I should call it sample efficient uh, process, uh, um, uh, entanglement Hamiltonian tomography. So in these original papers, um, uh, Andreas had written down formulas like the one over here. Uh, this is sort of like the classical shadows that we heard about, and this would be formally written here as the corresponding reconstruction of the reduced density matrix. And um, the way that how we look at these problems is that we have here the reduced density matrix where we would like to fit something where we have an ansatz for this entanglement Hamiltonian, and the ansatz is provided or suggested, and we want to test also for deviations from that by, for example, the Bisoniano Wichmann theorem here. And uh, the story then always sort of goes like this that we have here measurement data that we want to fit, uh, you know, to this density matrix row A parameterized in this uh, very certain form that we have over here, learning only a few parameters. And uh, I noticed that this makes, of course, this whole thing, the fact that we have a finite number of parameters over here, uh, this corresponds to having an efficient uh, way of, in terms of a sample complexity. Uh, but of course, you should never forget that here at the end, when we do our protocol, this will be on the next slide, we have to take the exponent here. So this is not, this is something that scales to over maybe 20 particles, sub subsystems of 20 particles, but not really much more. What I really want to emphasize is that it always works like this. They have data, you design an ansatz, uh, then you construct this reduced density matrix from this ansatz, then you fit this data, but then you have a verification step. So this is not only that you fit, then you go home, there's a verification step. And uh, if you want to see more details, it's sort of like saying that, well, we have reconstructed the density operator, but at the end, then we take more data. And Andreas has written a paper about how to measure, for example, cross fidelities and so on 
uh, in these kind of setups. So this is part of this toolbox, and I don't want to say more. And when I showed you before these plots, this was really sort of the ideas behind it. It's done here a little bit uh, different, actually, but that's not important, really, for the present context. Um, I want to show you one more sort of uh, theory slide over here. Uh, and uh, because I've not really talked, uh, I don't have a plot to show at the moment for the fidelity and the scaling, you know, of the number of measurements or experimental runs that you have to do with the subsystem size, because this is at the end, you know, the, the statement which is uh, behind the fact that we uh, are able to do an experiment and up to what system sizes we can go. I mentioned before that we can go, I guess, in the future up to about uh, 22, so it was more than we had in this um, uh, nature physics paper, they claim. But uh, if you look at this number of measurements that are required to achieve a certain fidelity, which is uh, larger than 98% in a very simple theoretical model simulation where we assume that we get a, a, a icing Hamiltonian, like what the trapped ion people have, you make an answer, you know, in terms of this Hamiltonian over here, plus then maybe also adding additional terms here. Uh, this would be the corresponding entanglement spectrum, including the errors that you have. But maybe the most important part is really here that when you see experimental wilds, uh, this would be uh, a projected um, a least square tomography over here, scaling the number of measurements. You know, you can see this would be prohibitive uh, in many cases. Uh, this is a low rank uh, least square, you know, tomography that you do here. And here we come in with sort of knowing something about the Hamiltonian, we parameterize it sort of in, a, in a already the correct way and then learn additional terms and see that they're small. Uh, this is essentially, I'm not saying completely flat, uh, but uh, you can see that these are ideas that actually scale. Of course, this applies to quantum simulation uh, because we have very specific assumptions here in the, in the background with all of that. Yeah. Uh, and so with this, I'm sort of at the point of uh, uh, summarizing uh, things here. Uh, what I have shown you now here is this, that we have done some theory experimental studies that look at area versus volume law uh, entanglement in the systems. And they sort of build on the fact that on one hand, we are able to prepare ground states, um, approximate ground states in our systems by VQE. In principle, you can replace this by something completely different or whatever you want. Uh, but we find it very difficult for a model like an Heisenberg model, you know, to really have an analog simulator that realizes a Heisenberg model and at the same time being by, for example, adiabatic state preparation, prepare the ground state. That's essentially, you know, very hard, almost uh, impossible for uh, trapped ion numbers of 51. And uh, for us, these uh, VQE circuits are kind of a shortcut in this whole story that, that we have here. Huh? And then we have this whole toolbox of, I explained it in terms of randomized measurement, where we are doing an efficient uh, process tomography, efficient, you know, in terms of sample complexity, but, um, you know, we still have to do some classical post-processing, which is exponentially expensive, where we are, are able then to fit, you know, entanglement Hamiltonian, where we know something or we believe that we know something by fitting, but then at the end, at the end and also verifying, you know, with more measurements that the results are sort of believable in this context. Um, and uh, it's great to see these things happen on real experiments. I mean, um, it is very important that uh, because we have short, uh, you know, circuits in uh, our ground state or approximate ground state preparation, um, that uh, this is the reason why, for example, decoherence in the particular context uh, is not uh, really important, but we can include if you want uh, all of these things and to some extent this is done. Let me just uh, sort of, uh, sorry, go back here. Uh, let me just uh, sort of conclude here by, by mentioning one thing that I talked about this processing uh, as a classical post-processing based on this randomized measurement where the classical expensive step is taking the exponent of this Hamiltonian. Uh, we have also written papers where, you know, based on certain experimental settings, one is able to replace uh, uh, this classical post-processing or randomized measurement in part by quantum circuits uh, and then to speed it up, and this should scale to much la larger particle number. But at the same time, I also want to emphasize that this comes to certain assumptions and also experimental assumptions that are behind it. Some of them, I believe, are actually quite uh, correct. And uh, so I'm very much looking forward to see similar things uh, being measured in a context that I find, of course, very interesting when we go to 2D. All of these protocols, these ideas that we talk about work in higher spatial dimensions. Uh, these theorems that we are using here, they should be valid in higher dimensions. And to see all of that, you know, uh, for um, 
integrable and non-integrable systems and so on, uh, I think that there's some interesting things to be done and I think it also works for lattice gauge theories and so on. So there's a very fundamental statement about the entanglement structure of this close to ground state and then going to excited states and so on that is uh, revealed by this kind of an interplay between different things that are coming together, part of them more quantum technology or new protocols, uh, but the other part then really being kind of, I would say, deep insights what we expect in quantum simulation as properties of a, of a many body system as we talked about over here. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so, yeah. Thank, thank you very much for a very nice talk. Uh, just a quick question. This coefficients beta, do they scale like inverse um, polynomial with system size? And well, uh, the original assumption was that uh, you have a Hamiltonian, okay, physical Hamiltonian, and we assume that this physical Hamiltonian, as we always have, and always sort of the sum of maybe one body, two body, three body terms, mm -hmm. but it's cut off very soon, so the number of terms that you have in the original Hamiltonian uh, scales polynomial with the system size, and then we simply deform this thing in order to get then the corresponding beta, and this is then uh, the sort of parameters that we fit, but we also test for additional terms that are there. Yeah, I understand, but th this coefficient is beta because uh, we expect the entanglement entropy is uh, area low, meaning there's this expectation of entanglement and uh, Hamiltonians should be constant, and because we usually know that if we have uh, uh, local Hamiltonians um, with extensive number of parameters, uh, we expect the number, the, the expectation and energy will grow with the system size, and to compensate the growth, growth with the system size, we need yeah. coefficients which compensate the growth, right? Yes, I mean, you should note, of course, that the entanglement Hamiltonian is not only the sort of, maybe I simplified this so much over here, the original Hamiltonian, uh, this is a, a constant also included, so that rho is equal to e to the minus h, so there's also a normalization part in there, which is then subtracted correspondingly. So uh -huh. the trace uh, h a is not the Hamiltonian where you can shift the ground state energy around, obviously, but it is something that has to be normalized in terms of the density matrix, and I think that this is taking care of uh, the things that you are thinking about at the moment. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can you can you hear me? Hi, Hi Peter. Uh, thanks uh, for the talk. I, my question was about uh, this BW theorem. Is it okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, you make an assumption and then you measure the entanglement entropy or entanglement spectrum. Uh, but what if I don't have that knowledge a priori? Uh, that's one. Or a related question is that, is there a measure of fidelity, the, the entanglement spectrum that I got, if I don't have access to some like classical simulation? Um, is, there a, is there a way that I can make sure that I've actually measured the correct entanglement mm -hmm. entropy? Or no, I have to look for some other protocols. Yeah. Uh, of course, in the present context, what we're doing is this, that we say that, you know, there's a prediction, uh, which is not in the form of a theorem, obviously, but uh, in the form of, you know, if you're adapted to the lattice model, then it is a good idea to suggest to you that uh, this is an answer to be tried out, and this is exactly what we're doing over here. Um, uh, so, in this sense, we sort of, uh, you know, if I give you a reduced density matrix and you're completely blind to do a tomography, you know, and uh, you just apply it. I mean, these Hamiltonian learning techniques, you will simply find that, uh, you know, uh, Hamiltonian learning has in principle built in, if I talk about standard Hamiltonian learning, and, and kind of an uh, error assessment, you know, that allows you, if I make an ansatz, I try to fit to the data, and then there's a certain error assessment. If I include maybe more terms, does the error go down? Do I sort of pick the right terms? So it tells you when it succeeds, but it also tells you when it when it fails, okay? And uh, for example, we did things like, uh, uh, if you looked at, say, um, a trotterized time evolution, when we go to the limit of a, of a trotter threshold, you know, when you take the time steps too large, and we're doing learning of a Floquet Hamiltonian, and if you do learning of a Floquet Hamiltonian that at the trotter threshold, this becomes a random Hamiltonian. And if you apply Hamiltonian learning in this particular context, you can try to include more and more terms, but you can see that this does not converge in the sense of the Magnus expansion, for example, also not converging. So in this sense, these things have built in a toolbox that say, okay, it doesn't work, uh, but if it works, then it does work, and uh, that's basically what we see over here in the particular context. 
So regarding this, uh, I know you also made statements about um, how do you know at the end that the uh, that it is sort of correct over here. So the part that I didn't show you yet, but it exists in part, is this that um, when you make an ansatz and you fit it to experimental data, okay, you get a Hamiltonian out, and it is some you know uh, local Hamiltonian that has a few of these uh, parameters in here, like we indicated. Uh, if I now uh, would like to test to what extent this thing is true, you can take more data. And uh, with the more data, you can compare the new density operator that you got out, you know, with the, with the old one that you had before. And this leads to an assessment of the corresponding fidelity of having learned the density operator. And uh, Christian can correct me over here, but in many of these cases here, it was about, I think, 99% uh, that we got for this many body, uh, for this, for this reduced density matrix over here, in terms of the corresponding fidelities. Uh, that lead us to believe that, uh, you know, what we do is, is kind of right. So there's a verification step in there that I see is essential because otherwise you can fit whatever you want, you know, with an answer and you get an answer, you want the fidelity and this is essential. Right? Christian, you want to make a statement about the fidelity that you got? So the, so the simple statement with this entanglement Hamiltonian demography is this, if you want to go to these very large system sizes, you have to assume something, but you can test it, okay? Hi, thanks for the very nice talk. Um, I had a clarifying question about the state prep protocol. So I understand that when you're in the low temperature limit, uh, you can use these variational algorithms. When you're up in the thermal uh, region, do you have to construct the entire Hierarchy of many body states? No, okay. Um, I didn't talk about this. It's sort of a, a technicality for us, but it is uh, very important. So in practice, it happens like this, that you might, for example, with a variation circuit, produce this superposition of the lowest 300 states, you know, in these huge manifolds. Uh, what's uh, the way how these sort of high energy states are prepared, and this is definitely the northern eigen state, actually just the opposite, I would say, is this that you can, for example, do something what we did originally, cool down to the ground state or approximate ground state, and then you try to heat it up uh, with a certain amount, and depending on how much energy you put in, you sort of expect that you produce something which is like a, a band of energies that you create there, you know, far from an individual state. Maybe, hopefully, it would be a microcanonical ensemble, but in practice, it may be far away from that. Or what actually Christian did at the end was then that you take the initial state, which is a product state, before you do the variational, you scramble this thing up by a quench, for example, with an XY, uh, Hamiltonian, and then you apply your cooling circuits. And this produces then, you know, sort of classes of states that are kind of random, whose mean energy we know, and these are the ones that we show over here. And if you, uh, whatever state you take, you always get roughly the same result, namely that it is skips with a constant temperature, and you would, uh, you know, you can take basically any state that you want, and it would uh, give, uh, because it's approximately a thermal state in the sense, in the sense of ETH, you know, um, give a distribution, which is uh, something with a, with a constant temperature. Uh, you know, this beta i that I showed you here, this inverse okay. temperature. Thank you. So I have maybe a related question. Uh, so, so did you use also your, in your theory this information about the variance to try to reduce the variance and get something closer to the ground state? Uh, okay, with 51 ions, I mean, uh, the techniques that we used before, we cannot test. And I mean, this we will be able to find out. Uh, if you are on the ground state, this was the earlier assessment you were saying, can you write down a variance and trying to minimize the variance in order to improve? This is very expensive. Uh, we tried this actually uh, years ago in a much, much smaller system. And uh, theoretically, that's very obvious. And I agree immediately in practice, this didn't work at all because it was too expensive. But maybe based on new insights uh, that uh, John talked about on, on Monday, you know, this, uh, this uh, should be kind of rethought. But over here, you know, we were asking things like, uh, I give you a certain microcanonical width for the excited state. You know, can I cool to this one with the variational ansatz uh, uh, with sufficiently low depths or so? No, and uh, but uh, this has not been done yet. Huh? Just a simple question. So can you test the purity of the state by looking at the other subsystem? Say again? Can you test like purity of the states by looking at the other subsystem? 
It should, uh, it should be symmetric. Did, okay, I, did, I didn't get it, sorry. Maybe you should take your mask off. And, uh. <laughs> yeah, like if you're seeing this volume loss scaling, can you see it in the other? I mean... You want me to go back to another slide? I just or? want to just test the purity of the state. That's, that's the, ah, that's the you want to know what, uh, what the purity is of your full uh, of the ground state that you produce after the uh, BQE? Yeah, just I'm just curious. Okay. So we cannot measure the total purity in this area because we can only look at subsystems and measuring the purity of the total thing is simply too expensive for us. Well, but you, you can start, I mean, just on the small systems. Like, just. Uh, yes, I mean, this was done. Uh, we did these things for smaller systems with quenches uh, uh, a few years ago. And uh, there, the main, um, you know, the main imperfections came from initial state preparation. Uh, from producing, you know, this kind of an L state, and then there was some some measurement error at the end, and I think that for a subsystem of uh, was it 10 ions, or then we could also then yeah 10 ions at that point, uh, the overall many body purity was including all of these additional preparation errors for something like 86 uh, point eight six or something like that. Okay. Um, but here the subsystem, so we cannot do that here. The system is simply too large. Yeah. I bet a nice slide, a, a nice talk. So I'm a bit wondering about the sample complexity. Can you say something more about that? Maybe I missed a part, like how this actually scales. Okay, so uh, this this Hamiltonian that we have over here is sort of uh, very simple because it only depends on very few parameters. Okay, and you would like to find out these parameters from your data. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so you have a polynomial number of parameters over here. So in, in order to fix this thing, you need, uh, in principle, only, you know, very few data. And this is exactly so you're not doing a tomography here, okay? Right. But when you want to do that, for example, using a formula like the one which is written over here, right. uh, if you put this thing on a computer, you have to do, and the way how it's being done at the moment, work out for the given uh, age that has this beta in here, uh, this exponential here. And doing these things for larger and larger systems, you know, if you go to subsystems of 20 or so, this then requires uh, special numerical techniques, and in this sense, it doesn't really scale, you know. But of course, I mean, it scales up to, you know, uh, 22 particles, as I said, uh, which is, you know, sufficient to see all of the phenomena that we have over here. Uh, but in principle, you would like to do something that is more efficient, you know, that avoids this kind of a classical bottleneck that we have as part of the algorithm that we have at the moment. If you go to 2D systems, this will be much more relevant, but as I said, you know, there's, uh, uh, other ideas that uh, show much, um, you know, show polynomial scaling in this sense with the subsystem size, but they make other assumptions. They are based on the fact that you can do quenches with deformed Hamiltonian and then build a variational algorithm around these things. So there's other answers for these things uh, that scale, you know, to these uh, much larger sub uh, subsystem sizes. So you're saying in this case, the, it's limited by the post-processing, not by the number of Experimental shots you need. That's what no, I'm no. Saying. This is uh, that's right. No. All right. So how, how does the number of experimental shots scale with the subsystem size or with the Well, this size? is what uh, was this plotted over here. You know, another example. You know, this was uh, ground states and then finding Bisoniano Wichmann. You can see the beautiful Bisoniano Wichmann linear ramp over here. This is uh -huh. theory, but uh -huh. then theoretical simulations. To what extent these answers is able to reproduce Bisoniano Wichmann in this uh, case here? And then looking at subsystem sizes are increasing, increasing, and increasing, here up to 18. And then looking at the total number of experimental runs that you have to do in order to achieve that. And standard tomography would be up here, you know. Right. And uh, what we do is kind of flat over here. Will you still scale exponential, no? Or is that sub-exponential? I'm just uh, confused about that part. I mean, I always thought all of those things would scale exponential. Maybe we can discuss it a little later. But you know, if I compare this with this thing over here, I think it will be much more happy over here. And by knowing that we can go to 22, uh, you know. Okay, let's thank Peter again. <laughs>